Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're thankful and grateful to the Almighty God that we are able once again to be ready for Bible study. And we're thankful that our being here is not against our will, but it is the gift of God. Even though there's been a dramatic change in the temperature, yet it's still a blessing to be in the land of the dying on our way to the land of the living. <coughs> Let us begin tonight with one of the church standards. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make up my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil or lose me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, he will help me. Over the world, a victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are thankful and grateful for another opportunity to call on your holy and righteous name. We thank you, O God, for you have given us this opportunity. And we come, O God, praying for all of the bereaved families tonight. We realize that uh, there are so many that are bereaved and there are so many uh, that are hurting because they don't understand why things are the way that they are. But ours is not to question why, but ours is to hear and obey. And we ask you to give us this strength 
give us that courage and give us that understanding. We pray for the sick tonight. And we pray that you would heal those. Heal them that need healing. Heal them. And we call out tonight, oh God, we call out Melvin Miller and his family. We realize, oh God, that they placed his wife in hospice. And we pray, oh God, that you would strengthen him. That he would be able to accept whatever happens as your will being done. It's never easy to pastor, but it's even harder when you're going through such a traumatic event. We pray, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, that you would touch him and that you would encourage his heart. Encourage all of those at our various churches that are sick tonight. Help them to understand that you're still a healing God, that you're still able to heal, and there's no sickness that you cannot heal, no sorrow that you cannot lift. We ask in the name of Jesus, give us, oh God, the understanding that we need so that we might motivate and move forward with your people and your church, that your will might be done. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen, amen, and amen. All right. Tonight, we are in going into a phase uh, that we're talking about. When bad things happen, and it seems like bad things are happening every day, and they seem to be getting closer and closer to home. Now, in our last lesson, we discovered what a hurting friend needs most is kindness, which reveals itself through compassionate actions. Hurting people don't need a theologian or a philosopher. They need someone to express genuine kindness to them. Now in this lesson, we discover what to do when bad things happen. Bad things. First off, the first thing that you need to do is reject half-baked theology. Theology is simple, God study. Bildad now replies to Job, and our lesson tonight, uh, you can find uh, what we are discussing in Job, starting at chapter 8, and it goes all the way through chapter 10. Bildad now replies to Job's response. He asked Job how long he will say such things and state that Job's words are like a blast of strong wind. In other words, Job was sounding like a blowhard. Bildad is apparently upset that Job refuses to accept Eliphaz's counsel. He asked Job if God perverts justice or what is right. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. But then this is what he tells Job in the fourth verse of the 8th chapter. And our, uh, our scripture tonight comes from the New King James. If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. He was saying, Job, if your sons and daughters have sinned, God cast them away because of what they did. If thy children have sinned, I know thy children have been cut off by a terrible judgment. But 
was it not because by transgressions they had filled up the measure of their iniquity? He then next tells Job, if he is pure and upright, God will restore him in his rightful place. He says, Job, future would be so prosperous, his beginnings will seem small. Job 8, verses 5 through 6. Bildad based his authority on the former age and fathers or authorities of the past, which tells Job, which teach Job understanding or wisdom. Bill that illustrates his point by first asking if rushes grow where there is no mar or marsh, or if the flag or reeds grow where there is no water. He tells Job that before they are ready to cut, they dry up quickly than any quicker than any other plant. Then Bildad says, this is the destiny of all who forget God. Chapter 8, verses 8 through 13. What he was really saying was, if your, if your children did wrong, the reason God cut them off when he did was because they had done wrong. In other words, he was saying these, these plants that he had named, he was saying they only grow in certain places. God's punishment only comes in certain places or certain times. And your children had to be guilty of something. Now, how many of us think like that? That when bad things happen to us, we have to be guilty of something. Bill Dad is giving him some bad theology. Bad theology. Because if you go back to the first chapter of Job, what did it say? When the sons, of da sons and daughters were before God, Satan came. And when he was asked, what have you been doing? I've been going to and fro, seeing whom I made devour. And when he was looking to see whom he might devour, God simply offered up Job by saying, have you considered my servant Job? Because he's an upright, he's a perfect and upright man. And none like him in the land. And Satan simply said, if you didn't have that hedge around him, I could destroy him. But you built a hedge around him, and I can't get to him. So God offered Job up for a test. He said, say that I don't care what you do to him. He will be faithful. Have you ever considered when bad things are happening to you that God is simply testing you, wanting you to be an example for those around you so that they can see that in spite of what they think or what they say, that there are some good folk left in this world, that everybody ain't a crook, Bill Dad continues by telling Job, his trust shall be a spider web, which suggests to Job that Job's security is in his possessions rather than God. How many of us today fall in that same category? Our security is in what we have. Our security is in stuff. Our security is in things instead of having our security in God. 
next he can pass Job to another uprooted bush that others will replace. Chapter 8, verses 14 through 19. Then, Bildad applies and makes another application to Job that comes from Job 8 and 20. It says, Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. Bildad was saying, God will not forsake the blameless. And he won't uphold evildoers. So again, his case that he's making is that, Job, you must have done something wrong. You are your children. Bildad wrongly assumed that Job was trusting in something other than God for his security. What are you trusting in for your security? What are you secure in? I made the statement when I was in a class, Theology 101, I made the statement that if I wasn't already rooted in my faith, I would not know what to believe. So he points out that such support would collapse. You, you, your faith is like a spider web. It's going to collapse. One of a person's basic needs is security. And many will do almost anything to feel secure. One of the things that when we go to, uh, when I go to VA and you go in to see the doctor, one of the questions that they ask you nowadays, they ask you, do you feel safe in your own home? And I laugh and say, yeah, I feel safe. I say, anybody dumb enough to break up in there, they're going to get a rude awakening. Bill that is sure Job has done something evil. He insists all of Job's adversity could be remedied if Job would simply repent. And can you imagine Job looking at him thinking, repent from what? I didn't do anything. His mouth would then be filled with laughing and his lips would be shouting for joy if he would just repent and say, I did wrong. Why would you repent for wrong that you have not done? Job had already prayed before all of these calamities came. Let me, my sons and daughters, are they're getting together for a birthday party. Let me pray now before they get together, lest they do something against God while they're partying. So he had prayed already that God would forgive them in case they did wrong. Job's enemy will be put to shame and the home of the wicked would be destroyed is what Bildad was saying. All of this suggests if Job denies he has sinned, he is a hypocrite. When stuff is going wrong for you, folks are looking at you thinking, what did you do wrong? When the truth of the matter is, you may not have done anything wrong. God is simply using you as an example of how you ought to be faithful to God in the good times as well as the bad times. If only relief from adversity was that simple. All you got to do is confess your sins and all your troubles will disappear. But all Bill Dad's words 
of condemnation, all they did was intensify Job's mental suffering. When bad things happen, reject half-baked theology. Don't let nobody tell you that if you go and cut off a black cat's tail and throw it in the river, your sins will be forgiven. That's bad theology. What passage of Scripture says you can do anything like that. What passage of scripture can you interpret to mean something like that? Oh well. Resist bad theology and then rely on a mediator. Chapter 9 of the book of Job. Job now begins his response, which covers two chapters, chapter 9 and 10. And I won't finish all of this tonight, but I'll finish it next week. As far as it goes, build as theology is correct. It's not so much what Bildad says as what he does not say. And we'll see that later on. Here's how Job begins. In verse in chapter 9 and verse 2, he says, Truly I know it is so. But how can a man be righteous before God? He asked a question. Let me ask you this question. And sometimes I think we need to, uh, when we, we hear what folks are being saying about us and what folks are saying we need to do in order to be prosperous in the eyesight of God. Who in the world can be righteous before God? Who? Job knows what Bildad has said is true in principle. But he asks how a person can be declared righteous before God. Job tells Job feels he cannot prove his innocence to an infinite, all-powerful God. Even if he could take him to court, he acknowledges God rules the universe, the sun, the stars, the heavens, the seas. He said, God makes the stars. Arteros, the Big Dipper, Orion. Pleiades, three star constellations in the sky. Verse, chapter 9, verses 3 through 9. Job says, God does great things that are incomprehensible to infinite humans. And his miracles are without numbers. He also said, God is invisible he passes by him but he cannot see him he cont continues that God takes away people in death and no one can stop him because his power is irresistible no one can ask what God is doing because God is sovereign I don't need anybody's permission to do what I do. Even proud helpers or Rahab that were thought to be mystical sea monsters, symbolic of evil, bow to the power of God. Chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. Since God is so awesome, God, Job asked the question, how he can answer him, even if he is righteous. 
Job cannot defend himself before such a great God. So let's look at what Job says in verse 15. For though I were righteous, I cannot answer him. I would beg for mercy of my judge. This is what Job thinks he must do. Regardless to the merit of his plea, since he cannot get his breath, Job believes God is wearing him out. Job says, even if he is right, his own mouth will condemn him because he would be confused before God. Have you ever considered that? If you had to stand before God and defend yourself, if you had to stand before God and defend what you did last week, if you had to stand before God and defend what you did last night, if you had to stand before God and defend what you did two hours ago, Joe said, what would I do? My own mouth would condemn me. Well, there's another fellow that I heard on the news this evening saying that he looks forward to getting on the witness stand to defend himself. And every lawyer on the council said, that's a bad idea. And here Job is saying, what would I do if I went before God? I would be confused because I know God already knows what I'm going to say before I even say it. And I'm trying to figure out how do I justify myself before God that knows what I think before I even think it. So how am I going to justify myself? It would not make any difference because Job says, God destroyed the perfect and the wicked. He states God is given the whole earth in his hands of the wicked and blindfold judges to judgment. He asks, if God isn't responsible, then who is? God is responsible for everything. So I'm not worried about trying to defend myself before God. Because I can't defend myself before God. Had you ever thought about it or considered that? Here Job is talking about, man, if I went before God, I'd be so confused. One reason I'd be so confused is because I don't remember the exact time and dates of certain things. Some stuff I've done, I don't even remember I did it. It's been that long ago. Or it was... It didn't really mean anything to me, so why would I would try even bother to try to remember it? So I threw a rock. I don't know where it landed. I didn't know it hit somebody upside the head. If you say it did, I have to take your word for it. It did. But God knows where it landed. Knows who it hit. Knows who it hurt. All right, my time is up for tonight. And I want you to be prayerful that we will have a successful anniversary service this weekend. Uh, events will start tomorrow. Uh, we are meeting with the newsman tomorrow. He's going to do a story on the church helping us celebrate our 100th anniversary. Uh, he did, the, I believe he's the same reporter that did the story when we, uh, when they uh, designated our building as a historical landmark. And uh, he's coming back to help us with our 100th anniversary. We ask you to be prayerful 
and that you would keep all lifted up in prayer. Now, we also want you to note that, and we expect to see all of our members, and you tell them, we expect to see all of them Saturday. Expect to see them all Saturday for the musical program Saturday evening at 4 o'clock. We're going to start at 4 o'clock so you can get out of there for dark. And be back home for dark so you can be ready for church Sunday morning. Uh, Sunday morning, in case you did not hear, pass the word. Reverend Stevenson will be bringing the message Sunday morning and Reverend Carpenter will be bringing the message Sunday afternoon. Now Reverend Stevenson was the pastor that I succeeded and he's coming back uh, to preach on Sunday morning and Reverend Carpenter, his link to the church is that his wife's mother was Deacon, is Deacon Robinson's sister. That's his link to the church. Because Uncle Sonny Boy was on our deacon board for over 65 years. So that's how we came to the conclusion and getting the people to do what they did, uh, what they are doing on the program. And now, I want you to pass the word. Pass the word. We're going to do the very best we can. Make sure we have a good time Sunday, Saturday evening, and a good time all day Sunday. And the weather is going to cooperate because it's already cooled off a, a substantial amount. So we should be, we shouldn't have any trouble staying comfortable because it's not going to be very hot anyway. And hopefully nobody will get sick uh, with these, uh, with this big of a change in the temperature as we're having. We, we almost 30 degrees cooler today than we were yesterday. And that the body doesn't adjust that fast. Be prayerful. Uh, things are happening everywhere. Stuff is happening. As the children say, stuff popping off everywhere. Places where you least expect it. I was talking to an officer today. And, and he was asking me some things. And I told him, well, I don't know a whole lot about it. I said, matter of fact, uh, everybody around this area, we kind of keep to ourselves. And he tells me, he said, that's the best thing for you to do is keep to yourself. You don't want to be on nobody's radar. I said, yep, that's the way I feel about it. And we talked and we had a few words and they went on about their, about their business and doing what they had to do. But it made me think about how things are changing and how quickly they are changing. As the older generation is passing away, there is so much stuff. That wouldn't have happened 25, 30 years ago. That's happening. Our churches are suffering. Because the younger generation doesn't see the relevance of God. I'm going to stop. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are thankful and grateful for another opportunity to study your word. We ask that you open our minds and hearts, allow your words to enter in, that we might become better servants unto thee. We ask, O oh God, that as we uh, study your word, that you help us to be better. Help us to walk closer with thee. Help us to be more prayerful. Help us to be more caring and concerned about others and about 
things that are going on in our lives and others' lives around us. We pray now that your blessings be upon all that are under the sound of my weak voice, that you keep them safe from all hurt, harm, and danger. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Some glad morning when the life is over, fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I fly away, I'm singing, I fly away, oh glory, I fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I fly away. 